In the South Indian state of Kerala, game wardens are horror struck. They discover a dead female elephant, then another, and another, each brutally killed in suspicious circumstances. For an elephant's jaw to be broken, that's a hell of an impact. The body count reaches 12 in all. It was very shocking. Finding so many corpses in their popular sanctuary is a huge concern to authorities here and experts worldwide. Something abnormal has happened. They fear some kind of crazed killer is on the loose. We were thinking it's a serial killer. But with no witnesses to the killings and scant evidence, the truth is hard to determine. We are confused. Totally we were confused. In a fast-running case, can the investigators track down who or what is the killer? Periyar Wildlife Sanctuary, a pristine 925 square kilometer block of land, is set high in the hills of the Indian state of Kerala. Surrounded by towns and villages, it's home to around 30 tigers and an estimated 900 wild Asian elephants. These are mostly divided into small herds, usually led by the oldest female. These endangered animals have become the greatest attraction in one of the most popular sanctuaries in South India and are proudly protected by staff. In March 2009, however, the peace of this sanctuary is shattered. Cannon, a local tribesman, has lived around the sanctuary all his life. I've been working here as a conservation guard since 1979. As he has for over 30 years, Cannon heads out to check on the status of the wild animals. If I'm on patrol and don't see any elephants, I feel disappointed. As Cannon enters the heart of the forest, he senses something weird. As I went into the forest, I smelled something rotten. I found a body close to the track, near the stream. It had been decomposing for some time. Though it's highly unlikely a tiger killed the elephant, Cannon must watch in case one comes to scavenge the corpse. When we're approaching an animal, we use binoculars to see if there are any tigers or elephants nearby. I went closer to examine it. As he approaches, he can see blood around its hindquarters. And three bloody wounds near its ears. Then I touched it. I saw a hole, so I put my finger in it. Alarmed by his discovery, Cannon calls the forest department headquarters. The forest department reacted very quickly. They arrived immediately. Dr. Gafur is the forest department veterinarian on duty. He and his team begin a post-mortem. Almost all the wounds are infected, some with maggots also infected with maggots. The rotting flesh is giving off a foul odor. Very full and discharge was there, very smelly. As they take samples for further tests, they get a shock. This elephant was pregnant. Unfortunately, one fetus was there, one male fetus. This is horrific enough, but Cannon senses there's worse to come. While they were doing the post-mortem, I could smell something from the other direction. Around a bend in the stream, he spots another body lying in the water.
Sometimes elephants sleep. So if we see an elephant lying down, we throw stones at it. But it's obvious this female elephant is also dead and has been for over a week. Her trunk is mutilated and flies are feasting on her flesh. It was very shocking and unusual. For Cannon, to discover two dead elephants on the same day is unheard of. I've never seen anything like that before. It's uncommon for elephants to die in the sanctuary. They're expected to live for around 70 years. Usually they find three or four dead elephants a year, and these have normally died from old age. Both of these elephants had been in their prime. It was a big, big issue, and the forest department was on high alert. Dr. Bala's job is to monitor the well-being of the elephants in the sanctuary. We were wondering how, what could be the reason for the death of these animals. Now, Dr. Bala and his colleagues are forced to turn from conservationists into investigators. Because just two weeks earlier, fishermen had found another dead elephant. That in itself had been unusual and distressing. But now they have three dead elephants on their hands. They're facing a major problem. The first carcass we found, the body was floating on the water. We didn't know what has happened to this animal. Dr. Gafur had again been on duty. He tried to examine the body in the lake but it was hard to work in the water, and its flesh was extremely decomposed. It was almost a putrefied carcass, bloated, heavily bloated. Kafur figures it's a female elephant, around 40 years old, but he can't determine her cause of death. But now, with two new cases, there appears to be a link. All three bodies had been found in or near water. Could the dead elephants have been poisoned by something in the water? Some stretches of the Periyar River are among the most polluted in the state, and possibly in the whole of India. This river flows through the middle of the sanctuary. Water samples are collected, but they can find no evidence of poison. This deepens the mystery around these three deaths. The investigators move rapidly to examine the corpses for external clues. In the case of the body in the lake, there's a single wound in the animal's head. I found that deep penetrating wound, in the external ear canal, and the pus was oozing out from the ears. Could this wound match the hole Cannon had put his finger in? Are they both, in fact, bullet holes? The injury was the major concern for us. Animals which was poached might be having some injury, bullet injury. Elephant poaching for ivory is a huge concern worldwide. Though illegal in India, the impact of poaching on sanctuaries like this one can be devastating. Tusks are frequently smuggled to the Far East, then carved into high-value decorative items. Have the investigators uncovered a criminal ring of poachers that's targeting their prized elephants? Or could there be another culprit? With three elephant corpses on their hands in just two weeks, they must urgently find out how poachers could be getting into the sanctuary. Authorities are anxious they may be witnessing a new outbreak of poaching. 
we were just trying to collect information. Maybe somebody might be doing this. Researchers estimate the number of Asian elephants has been cut in half over the last 60 years, many as a result of poaching. Only male Asian elephants have large tusks, so they're most frequently targeted. But females, too, have sometimes been killed for their smaller, shorter tusks. While there have been no confirmed elephant poaching cases here for nearly a decade, officers are taking no chances. Using a metal detector, they test all three corpses for the presence of bullets. But there's no telltale alarm. We have checked for the bullets in the body. There were nothing, no object in the body. It's some relief, but it means the investigators are running out of reasons for these mystifying deaths. We are confused. Totally we were confused. The last obvious lead is the foul-smelling pus seen around the wounds. This could indicate infection, and more worryingly, disease. We started suspecting some outbreaks. We collected almost all the samples and sent for laboratory diagnosis. As disease appears likely, and fearing that the elephants may be contagious, Gafur incinerates the corpses. We burned the carcasses after post-mortem, when we suspect some diseased conditions. Not only elephants, but other endangered animals in the sanctuary, like tigers, could be at risk. But the forensic tests are conclusive. No disease that could kill an elephant is found in any sample. There was nothing, no sign of disease or anything. Still baffled, the investigators receive an urgent report. Guards have discovered another corpse. The fourth in as many weeks. It was really shocking for me. It was so unusual. Again, it's a female elephant, found less than a mile from the two corpses discovered days earlier. I felt very bad about it. But this one has been killed in the most unusual way. We could not find any external wounds, no, uh, deep penetrating wounds. An internal examination, though, shows clear evidence of major trauma. Her jaw is smashed into pieces. Bones and teeth, everything is destroyed. It would take a huge force to cause this much damage something around the size of a truck. An elephant's jaw is incredibly strong, fundamentally a grinding machine. It will eat tree trunks. Dr. Kate Evans has spent thousands of hours researching elephants in the wild. I've seen an elephant chew on a palm tree, which is hard as anything, like a cigar, and consume it. These jaws are incredible. So for an elephant's jaw to be broken, that's a hell of an impact. The investigators urgently need to work out what caused such massive injuries. And whether or not this also caused the death of the other victims. One elephant has a mutilated trunk. Two have holes in their head. And now one has a shattered jaw. And all have died in the space of four weeks they seem to have only one thing in common. All were females in all cases, so there were no males. But why would all the victims be female? We didn't know, and we started uh, thinking in other angle. To try and find out, they search for clues buried among the photos of the corpses. Sifting through the images, they uncover a crucial clue. When the corpses were burned, their bones were exposed. By a stroke of luck, this gives them a breakthrough. 
the skull of one victim has a single circular hole in it. The skull was pierced. Skull, there was a big hole on the skull. If this hole was made by a bullet, it'd be a lot smaller and have clean edges. A lot of broken pieces were there, so there was a big injury. Unlike jaw bones, the upper part of an elephant's skull isn't solid. It has a honeycomb structure that makes it lighter, but also more vulnerable to injury. The hole they've found goes all the way through this honeycomb to her brain cavity and is probably what killed her. But before they can work out why the hole is there, the investigators are called to another case. This fifth corpse not only adds to the authorities' problems, it further clouds their investigation. They're forced to eliminate one of the only common factors in the case, that all victims are female. There was a carcass of a male. It was a subadult male, 10 year old male. This victim, like the previous one, has suffered massive trauma. Severe injury was near by jugular vein area, then abdominal area, then the ribs was broken. Backside also one deep penetrating wound was there. There were severe injuries in that case. Who or what could have caused the penetrating wounds found here and in other cases? Two days later, the investigators get a lead that brings them closer to an answer. They return to check the site of the male corpse. As they approach, they see its trunk has been severed. More crucially, the corpse is not alone. Standing nearby is an adult male elephant with large tusks, known as a tusker. This tusker came and inspected the body, and he took that uh, trunk. And it was roaming around for some time. Elephants are herbivores. He's not here to scavenge. So why is he here at all? We were wondering whether this animal might be involving in the uh, death. If this tusker is involved in this death, can he also be blamed for the other killings? Could he have caused the holes found in three of the victim's bodies? We were thinking this can be caused by a very big object, most probably by a tusk. But why would a tusker attack and kill his fellow elephants? Elephants do fight, but it's usually just the males, and it's very uncommon for one to kill another. It is very unusual because obviously if you get in a fight, you risk your own safety, and what drives most mammals is survival. Any fights that do take place are usually between males sparring for dominance. Male elephants are more prepared to fight with other males, but for one purpose, and that is to, to um, mate with females. It might be possible a tusker had killed the young male during a battle for mating rights. But is it likely he would kill a series of females he could mate with? From an evolutionary perspective, you don't want to kill your females, you want to get them pregnant. Despite this, and because they have so little else to go on, the investigators pursue a stunning theory. They suspect this tusker could be the killer. The tusk is very short but very thick, so it can easily, it can pierce, it can make injuries. So we started thinking in that line. They believe the holes they'd found had been made by this tusker. In their mind, this elephant could be a serial killer. He's one of the oldest tuskers in the sanctuary. There are three or four around the same age and size, so they make a note of one distinguishing feature. His tail has a lot of hair and is shaped like a fishtail. So then we started following the animal. 
The next day, a tracking team is set up to try and keep him under surveillance. It's extremely hard to keep tabs on any wild elephant, especially in 925 square kilometers of forest. Unlike females that stay within the herd, males are mostly solitary and can roam large distances. It can take two or three days to find one particular elephant. But they've got a plan of where to search. All the bodies were discovered within eight square kilometers and all were close to the lake. So they comb the forests around the lake's edge. Eventually, they get close enough to identify him. He was about 35 years old. He had a huge body with a tail like a fish tail. Subash radios back to base. The investigation team heads straight there. They're joined by a senior veterinarian, Dr. Eastwarren. I was fortunate to observe this particular male for an hour or so. As he's filming, Eastwarren witnesses astonishing behavior. The tusker appears to be sexually aroused. He's masturbating. Masturbation is not normally seen, so that should the animal is in a high, you know, plane of sexual desire. The investigators wonder whether this might provide a motive for the attacks on the females. If he's so aroused, had he tried to force himself on the victims? He could be sexually frustrated, so it was attacking the females. Is this the reason some of the victims have wounds around their hindquarters? Injuries were found in the vaginal area. We also found some injuries in the rectal and uh, uh, perineal area. The investigators imagine he must have inflicted the wounds in some kind of sexual frenzy, having been refused the chance to mate. They have no proof for their suspicion, but if true, they could now be facing a sexual aggressor who's warped into a serial killer. They keep him under surveillance to see if he'll show any signs of aggression. Just a few kilometers from where the most recent corpse was found. It was roaming here and there, maybe in search of something, I don't know. It is not the normal elephant's behavior. They can see dark liquid streaming from the side of the animal's head. It's a sign that he is in must. Must is a time each year when males come into peak mating season. It can cause their testosterone level to rise by more than 50 times the normal amount. Must signifies to the males that he is strong and therefore not to mess with him. And secondly, it signifies to the females that he is strong, he's got strong genes. For elephants, increased testosterone often means increased aggression. It will not have the normal control over the mind. It will have an attic kind of behavior. So he was totally free to do anything. The must season in the sanctuary starts in February, the month the first corpse was found. The investigators believe this tusker's killing spree is caused by must. For proof, they need to keep a constant watch over him. But as the light falls, the risks of being somewhere this remote start to rise. Tigers start hunting at dusk. So for safety, they must head back to base. The following morning, the trackers set out to re-find the suspect. There's no sign of the tusker. But shockingly, they do find another body. It's a female. Her body is extremely decomposed. The vets are disturbed to find her jaw fractured, just like in an earlier case. The oral cavity was destroyed. Uh, the maxillary bones and everything was uh, broken. It's not certain if a tusker is strong enough to cause this much damage. 
and there's no sign of tusk wounds. But the investigators decide their suspect has again brutally smashed an elephant's jaw and dislocated its teeth in a ferocious attack. To their mind, he's out of control. I thought there must be something wrong with this tusker, some psychological problems. With six corpses in just over a month, they're struggling to keep up with the tally of deaths. The media has got hold of the story, spreading the news across India and worldwide. A serial killer is said to be running amok. And the issue has reached government level. The chief wildlife warden for the state insists a committee of experts goes urgently to the sanctuary to solve the case. Professor Jacob Chirin is summoned from his lab in Trasur, half a day's drive away. So we must try to find out what could be the reason for this fracture and other things. Even though he has over 50 years' experience working with elephants, he's mystified by what he finds. I have never come across uh, such a, uh, an instance. None of the team members had any idea what could be the reason. Yet even before he and the other scientists can get started, they're greeted by further bad news. An injured female elephant has been spotted by the lake. A boat driver films her on his camera phone. Staff are trying to keep her alive by squirting water into her mouth. Her trunk is paralyzed, so she can't drink normally. She has wounds in and around her eyes, leaving her blind. Could her injuries be the work of the tusker? The efforts of the inquiry committee take on more pressing urgency. They examine all the evidence collected by the investigators. We have been making a, a story from a lot of uh, loose uh, ends of a thread. This is the only tusker was found in that surrounding area. There was no other tusker. They decide to focus on the prime suspect. Only one tusk is... For a male to kill another is rare, even when in must. For one to kill a female is rarer still. And to kill a series of females is unprecedented. What's happening is so unusual, they have to search far and wide to find anything similar. Oh, this is a video. Yeah, it's, oh, that's a video. You can, you can watch it. See, so. There's one case in South Africa that could offer them supporting evidence. It, too, features extreme, deviant behavior among elephants. Between 1992 and 1997, in Palanisburg Reserve, young male elephants in must use their tusks to attack around 40 white rhinos. The attacks appeared to have a sexual motive. They tried to mate with female elephants that wasn't any receptive. They then tried um, a similar sort of scenario with the next big gray thing, which happened to be rhino. In some cases, they tried to rape the rhino before killing them. Researchers worked out the reason for the violence was that these young males lacked guidance and discipline. The older, wiser males who could provide this had been eliminated by poaching. Big old males have a really important role to play with younger males. They need disciplining and these older bulls have that mentoring role. When you miss out on this disciplining, these young males are kind of free to run riots. The similarity to historic events in this sanctuary rings alarm bells for those on the inquiry committee. A lot of similarities are there. Punch on. In the head. Small pieces of evidence are adding together. There are compelling reasons why this tusker may be so violent. Poaching of elephants here during the 1970s, 80s, and 90s was relentless. An estimated 350 elephants were killed. Hardly any tuskers over the age of 20 survived. Could the reason this tusker has lost control and started killing 
be that he'd grown up without older males to teach him how to behave. Behavioral problems are much, much more in elephant than any other animal. Because the more the complicated the mind, more the complicated the behavior problem. It now seems they could be dealing with an emotionally damaged Tusker. So crazed with sexual desire, he has killed six of his fellow elephants with no sign of letting up. It is something like a snowballing effect when he is being refused, especially in a heightened libido. He became furious. There are, however, differences between events in this sanctuary and the case in Palanisburg. There, several elephants were behaving violently, and each was around 18 years old. In other words, they were ill-disciplined teenagers. Here, the suspected killer is twice that age, and he seems to be running riot on his own. Despite these differences, they conclude the sanctuary has a serial killer on its hands. This animal was attacking. He goes beyond the limit. Whether this limit also included smashing the jaws of two victims or mutilating the trunks of two more is not clear. After 48 hours and based on circumstantial evidence, they announce their verdict. These scientists had reached the unparalleled conclusion that what had killed one male elephant and five females was one of their own species. They believe one of the oldest tuskers in the sanctuary has become a testosterone-fueled, uncontrollable killer. He's turned this once peaceful place into a danger zone for female elephants. And now they believe they have further proof. The blind and paralyzed female elephant, filmed by Boatman three days ago, is dead. Hers is the seventh corpse in five weeks. Low down on her stomach, they can see a penetrating wound, likely made by a tusk. In the eyes of the authorities, the tusker shows no sign his killing spree is about to end. <laughs> I've heard of men who molest women. It's the same kind of aggressive behavior with this tusker. But now they're faced with a dilemma. How can they stop the attacks? It's illegal to kill any elephant in India unless it's a danger to people, diseased or disabled. Poaching has left the sanctuary with so few tuskers, they can't even afford to try and capture him for fear of accidentally killing him. We thought of cutting the tusk, but capturing elephants is a very risky because the terrain here, it's undulating, highly undulating. So capturing is itself is a very dangerous affair in uh, this sort of a hilly, rolling mountain terrain. Because many time, you know, that's will occur uh, during the process of capture because the animal will uh, fall in the slope or it may or into some marshy or what logging area. A lot of problems are there. This leaves them with few options. All they can do is monitor his behavior, hoping they can somehow warn him off killing again. On April 10th, 2009, they locate him. He's not alone, but with a herd of other elephants. After keeping him under surveillance for several hours, they make an unexpected observation. I was observing from morning to evening. There were no scary behavior, nothing. Peacefully, they were all feeding. They presume his change in attitude is because his must period is coming to an end. 
The amount of time an elephant's testosterone level stays high depends on its age. When these young males come into must for the first time, it can last for just a couple of days. But then as they age, it can last for longer periods. The alleged culprit is middle-aged. His must period will normally last around two to three months. It should be over before the end of April. He became less aggressive and less libido. So naturally he comes down, cooled down to the normal level. After following him for several more weeks and seeing no more aggression, the authorities decide to stop monitoring his behavior altogether. I thought the killing had stopped. By the end of May 2009, they're confident the crisis has solved itself. At least until the next must season. They're wrong. On June 12th, 10 weeks after the earlier spate of killings, the sanctuary is struck again. Another female elephant is discovered with deep penetrating wounds in her head. There's also evidence of injury around her hindquarters. And three days later, alerted by tribespeople, another corpse is found just five miles away. As the Tusker accused of previous attacks is no longer in must, some investigators think this rules him out as the culprit. I don't think those deaths were caused by this particular elephant. Could be due to some other reason. But if he isn't the killer, <laughs> then who is? Outside the sanctuary, other scientists think the problem may be bigger than the authorities suspect. Its history of poaching might be having a more damaging impact than they'd imagined. The fact that Periyar has lost almost all its older tuskers means the population has been growing in the absence of large tuskers for several decades. With the absence of controls that uh, the larger bulls impose, these males are likely to be behaving much more abnormally. Ujjay Desai chairs a global network of Asian elephant scientists. And he's one of the most experienced hands-on researchers in India. He agrees most of the deaths resulted from sex-crazed attacks, but not by just one tusker. In a population that has been exposed to such abnormal situations, we really can't be certain that it's just one animal or one tusker. It could be multiple tuskers. Desai thinks this sanctuary is harder hit than others because poaching here was so extreme. When researchers arrived in 1989 to work out how many elephants had survived the poachers, they were astounded by their count. Normally, they'd find one male for every six females. Here, there was just one male for every 120 females making this the most skewed gender balance anywhere in the world. It means this sanctuary has a uniquely distorted nature. We know that poaching has uh, such a serious impact on the elephant social organization. So you would find that, you know, more than one is reacting in the same way as that particular animal. All the older tuskers would likely be affected, not just the alleged culprit. Each could have witnessed and been traumatized by the killing of their parents. But while some believe the wildlife sanctuary is facing a solitary, sex-crazed lady killer, if Desai's theory is correct, they've underestimated the problem. The sanctuary may actually be facing multiple disturbed killers. Now in March 2010, a year after the first seven deaths had occurred, and with Tuskers in must, the authorities are on high alert. We were thinking that it's going to be another series of killing happening. 
On March 20th, in a remote part of the sanctuary, some tour guides are settling down for the night at their campsite. At night we heard two elephants making noises. We could hear a sound like the forest was shaking. Is the lady killer back? Or is there a new killer on the block? We went closer. But we couldn't see. Even with flashlights, they can't identify the elephants involved. At daybreak, they head to the site of the fighting and discover the body of a female elephant. The tour guide is certain he knows the identity of the killer. Only days before, he and other guides had seen a tusker in the area. It had a short, huge body with short, sharp tusks. This sounds like the fish-tailed lady killer except that this tusker's tail is a different shape. It has fewer hairs. It looked like a normal elephant's tail, with a lot of hair missing. They hadn't seen the lady killer, but a different tusker altogether. It seems there's proof other tuskers are also running riot. The sanctuary could be beset by a phenomenon. Two lady killers have been identified. But are there any more? No killings are reported for two years. But in March 2012, a tribal fisherman named Pandian catches sight of an abnormal event. I saw a male elephant. Chasing a female. He attacked her, but she didn't die straight away. For the first time, there's an eyewitness to an attack. Once the sound of fighting dies down, he goes on shore. I followed the stench to find the dead body. Pandian has no doubt about the identity of the killer. He's convinced it's different from the other two tuskers. The one I saw had long tusks. These are much shorter. It's a different elephant. And it's got a different tail. It was not like a fish tail. His tail was more like a needle. No hair or anything. With the fisherman's account, three different tuskers have been identified, each with a different tail shape. And each responsible for killing female elephants. Crucially, there is little or nothing that can be done to stop any one of them before they act again. Removing the oldest tuskers will only reinforce the problems caused by poaching in the first place. Now we realize that not only have we reduced the male-female ratios, but we have basically upset the whole uh, social fabric of the elephant society. Poaching hadn't only impacted those elephants killed at the time. These tuskers had lost their parents and their role models. If you start taking out male elephants, you are going to have knock-on consequences. If they have a traumatic past, that can affect their future. In this sanctuary, the consequences proved to be an unparalleled series of brutal killings. And sadly, the horror of recent times may not be over. It's possible these older tuskers will pass their violent ways onto younger ones. There's nothing to stop other elephants from uh, picking 
of this behavior. So I think the larger lesson here is that our intervention in nature is not limited to the physical damage, but also affects a significant part of the social and behavioral aspects of nature, which we have no clue of right now. So far, this man-made problem has no man-made solution. But from now on, each must season, those tasked to protect the animals will always need to be on alert. Unfortunately, lady killing may be the new normal in Periyar Wildlife Sanctuary. <laughs>